So hi, my name is what? Uh, J.T. Everhard. Um, thank you, someone, for getting that joke. Um, before I, I took the gig with the Secular Student Alliance, uh, like a lot of you, I was a student at a little podunk college in Missouri, uh, Missouri State University, where I co-founded and led their Secular Student Alliance affiliate, which is the Missouri State University chapter of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, which sounds really silly, but after about a year, we were one of the biggest and most active college groups in the country. Debbie Goddard remembers that, so yay! Um, the pinnacle of what we did was Skepticon. Uh, which is a conference which in its third year last year was probably the second biggest gathering of skeptics and agnostics in the country behind the amazing meeting. Um, but uh, something that was, uh, two things that were unique about it is one, it was free to get in. You showed up, just walk in, and you were good. Second thing, entirely put on by a student group. No, no big organization, no big budget, uh, and we did it with the support of groups like the Center for Inquiry, Debbie Goddard is here, and the Secular Student Alliance, which I now work for because thankfully it caught their eye and they <laughs> decided to hand me money. Um, on January 3rd of this year, I became the Secular Student Alliance's high school specialist and campus organizer, and it has been the time of my life. Uh, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, coming in, I had some expectations for what my job would be like. Um, I expected that the challenges for high school students would be less daunting than they were for people in the world at large. Um, for one thing, financial support. Things like the American Humanist Association Convention cost a lot of money. Um, and I figured high school events would be less financially draining. Uh, they would also have the support of their parents, of their school. So finances wouldn't be nearly as big a deal for me as they were for things like Skepticon or, or for conventions like this. Another thing is guidance. High school students have a litany of resources at their disposal. Things like guidance counselors, teachers, parents, people that are there to nurture them you know, into going to college and things like that. Um, so they wouldn't have to deal with you know, all the stresses of autonomy that you know, bigger groups like this do. And, and lastly, I figured because they were Figured, I'm from Arkansas, can you tell? Um, I figured that because they were minors, they would have some extra protections in place uh, to look out for their rights, watchdog groups, to make sure uh, their rights were being respected and they were being respected as human beings. And see, Debbie's known me for a while, and if my parents were here, they would tell you, I have made some bad assumptions in my life. <laughs> and in the pantheon of bad assumptions, the tallest pillars were constructed for assumptions like these, because I was dead wrong. Um, what I found when I took this job was something completely different. I found, I, and I have found in the last three months, that the challenges facing high school students are more harsh and more daunting than, than uh, other organizations face. And I'll touch on that. Consider uh, this conference, the American Humanist uh, Conference. Costs a lot of money, um, but it has a certain list of responsibilities and tribulations that come along with it that are present even for high schoolers who want to bring in speakers or run speaker events, and they do. Uh, BTW non-theists in Oklahoma this year is bringing in Bobby Kirkhart. Redlands out in California is bringing in David Fitzgerald. So they want to run these type of events, and they have all of the hassles that go along with them. But now, imagine someone sent Clayton Witt and the American Humanist Association a check and said, use this to put on your convention. Well, it's really simple. He takes it down to the bank account and deposits it. Same if the Secular Student Alliance gives a project grant to a group. We can't write out checks to individuals, so we write them out to the group and they deposit it. Last I checked, minors couldn't really start bank accounts. They couldn't you know, manage money without an adult overseer. So even getting them money for something like this is a problem. But even take something like travel. You, know, you guys want to come... So someone giggled. Um, <laughs> you guys, if you want to come to something like this convention, you buy a plane ticket, you hop in a car, and you go. High schoolers can't do that so much. There's permission slips, there's lack of driver's license. There's, you all know as well as I do that most atheists come from religious families. So there's getting parental permission to, to go have people tell you that atheism's great. Um, so so there, there's a whole host of problems there, and there's a lot more red tape too. It, Clayton's not in the room, but I can tell you as someone who has organized conferences that it's a, a nightmarish hell on its own. <laughs> but even more so if I had to seek approval at every feasible step of the way from an administrator or, or some kind of student committee who didn't want me there. Skepticon would have never happened if that was the case. But this is what high schoolers have to deal with. But there's other uh, differences 
that are a lot more plangent at the high school level. A lot of you are, are vocal atheists, Sean Gillespie. <laughs> um, who, and imagine if the course of your day, your vocal atheism moves a religious person to punch you in the face. Now, in the case of Sean, um, they've just done you a favor because now you own their house. <laughs> because if someone punches an adult, it's assault. But in high school, if someone's a vocal atheist and they get harmed on account of it, it's detention. Anybody notice a big difference there? <laughs> but people deal with this. Um, what's another one? Uh, unique challenges facing high school groups uh, that I found aside from that. Ostracism. When I first took this job, we had 12 high school groups, 12 high school affiliates. And of those 12 high school affiliates, two of their leaders had to lead in secret, still have to lead in secret. We can't send them packages with our name on it. Uh, sometimes we can't send packages with their name on it. Sometimes we have to send them to other locations. Because if their parents found out, they would be kicked out of their house. And yet, at least in the, when I got the job, two of them decided that, that was worth it that the sanctuary they needed within the high school system was important enough that they could take this scenario where they have everything to lose and, and, and still do it. Uh, but also, you know, for, for those of us you know, out of college or even in college, if someone doesn't like us for being a vocal atheist, well, to hell with them, we go find other people to be our friends. But in high school, vocally saying that the cherished beliefs of you and your family are false, or that we don't need them to be a good person, this can be social suicide. And without a support group to give them that opportunity, it just doesn't happen. Another one is vandalism. Uh, Brian Brownbridge is the faculty advisor at Myler High School out in California of all places. And just last month he had his classroom door vandalized with people painting crosses on it and painting crosses in his window right next to the Secular Student Alliance poster. Um, another case, we've got another uh, group wanting to start a Secular Student Alliance affiliate in the Deep South, and they just had a Gay-Straight Alliance at their school come in, and while it was forming, the people orchestrating that had their cars keyed, had their cars egged, and their other personal property destroyed in some other way. And they're worried that if they try to make a Secular Student Alliance affiliate, that the same thing is going to happen. And you know what? They're right. That is a perfectly legitimate fear, and it probably will. But it's something that they have to deal with at that level that isn't necessarily present elsewhere. Good news clubs. <laughs> you want to talk about pure evil. <laughs> Let me tell you what they do. They, um, they're, they're groups of students with, with a national headquarters uh, in Missouri, my home state. <sighs> um, and what they do is they wait for the last bell of the day and they rush over to the first, the second, and the third graders and, tr and try to convince them that Jesus exists under, pretense, under the pretense of being associated with the school. And you're trying to exploit that gap in the psychology of, of children that lends credence to anybody in authority position. And they make no bones about this. I called their headquarters here a couple months ago and the guy I talked to flat out told me, most people come to Christ between 4 and 14, that's when we need to get them. It is dishonest. It is nothing short of playing dirty, but it exists. Wish we could pray it away, but that doesn't work. Um, and and the, one that, the one that really I spend most of my time on is obstructive administrations, which makes sense. You know, here are these people charged with taking care of, of these students. And they take the responsibility very seriously. The problem is that some people who take the responsibility very seriously think we need religion to be moral. Uh, I think heaven and hell are in the balance. And in the interest of protecting those students, sometimes, oftentimes, they try to hamstring the creation of these groups. Uh, and they do it in very specific ways. I totally learned how to use PowerPoint for this. <laughs> um, they'll drag their feet. They'll ignore that the group is forming and hope that the student will either lose interest or graduate. Uh, this is usually the first thing that happens. When the students push, they'll either flat out refuse or they'll do this nifty little trick of requiring a willing faculty sponsor, which sounds fair at first glance and sounds non-problematic at first glance. But here's a, a mysterious pattern that I've noticed. And I've noticed it's happened well over 10 times in, the, in my three months on the job, where the administration will say to the students, you need a willing faculty sponsor to make this affiliate. They will get the willing faculty sponsor, take it to the principal, who then refuses. They'll push harder, 
and the administration will crumble, but the willing faculty sponsor suddenly is less willing. And in a couple of situations, we've had that teacher flat out say, they told me this would be a bad career move. It's not fair, it's not right, but it happens, and it happens a lot. So we have all these negatives that I've come across and have somehow gotten through them without drinking copious amounts of alcohol. <laughs> um, it, but it is depressing that they have to deal with that in all seriousness. Um, but there are some positives. Because something I've really found is there is a litany of capable students doing everything they can to overcome this. Um, one of them is actually in the room with us today. Uh, this is Jessica Alquist. She's sitting right there and blushing, I hope. <laughs> Everybody should give her a round of applause because she is in... You don't even know why yet! <laughs> because I said so. Um, give me $20. <laughs> Everyone. Okay. Uh, Jessica Alquist goes to school in Cranston, Rhode Island. And where for the last 50 years there's been a prayer banner in the gym which invokes the phrases, Our Heavenly Father and Amen. Now, for those of us in the know, uh, I speak of in the know as in the uh, First Amendment, uh, this is kind of a flagrant offense against the First Amendment. So Jessica did the proper thing and asked the administration to take the prayer banner down. And su surprise, surprise, they refused. So she asked some adults to ask them to take the prayer banner down, and once again they refused. So then she had some people with really scary initials after their, after their names send the school a letter saying, you should probably take this down. Again, they refused. So then those same people with the scary initials sent them another letter and said, no, really, you should take this down or we're going to sue you into oblivion. <laughs> and once more, they refused. So now Jessica is the plaintiff in an ACLU lawsuit against her school to get the prayer banner taken down to avoid the marginalization. Which brings me to the case of Brian Lisko. Brian Lisko uh, attends high school at Stephen F. Austin, uh, Austin High School down in Texas. And I got this job in January. Yeah, it's, I heard groans at the mention of Texas. You are 100% right. Um, and eight months before I took this job, he had been fighting with his administration to get a secular club. And they had ignored him and stonewalled him. And Liz, my boss, had emailed, him, emailed them and they had ignored her. So then I get the job and I get referred to this case eight months down the line. And it's a personal flaw, but I have a lot less patience than Liz. <laughs> A lot less. And so I, I emailed and got ignored and after about three or four days of getting ignored I decided to call up the chain until I got their superintendent there. I said, you know, what is going on? Why is this happening? Why, does he, why is he not allowed to have a group? And it was pretty much a 15 minute carousel of getting trotted through every bad argument on earth for why they couldn't have a secular group. And it got to the point where I flat out told him, you know, you're just giving me excuses at this point. What you're doing is illegal. Needs to stop. And even with that, there was nothing. But then USA Today took notice. <laughs> um, and, and these are quotes from Brian. Remember what I talked about, you know, the, the quotes Jessica giving in the media? These are, these are from Brian. These are from a high school student. At one point, the principal said he could have the club if he just called it a philosophy club and did not affiliate with the Secular Student Alliance. Now, who wants to bet me that when Ignite or their Christian or Campus Crusade for Christ affiliate on campus applied for their group, who thinks they asked them to be a philosophy club? <laughs> who thinks they asked them not to affiliate with their national headquarters? So what we have here is a case where atheists really were being marginalized. And Brian caught it. He caught it and he wouldn't back down. He said, we atheists are already invisible. We don't come out. And that's a form of repression in itself. It's about getting pushed to the margin in our community. And he was right on, and he fought the good fight. And my favorite quote from this whole article, after a request for comment from USA Today, the school abruptly granted Lisco the Secular Student Alliance Club. Now, victory! Now, when they say abruptly, let me tell you how this went down. They emailed the scub, the scub? School. English, fun language, you can speak it too. Seven years of college. But I was a music major. So, um, they emailed the school every day for five days. We're doing this story, can you give us a, a quote? And got ignored. Day one got ignored. Day two got ignored. Day three got ignored. Day four got ignored. Day five. We're doing this story, can you send us a quote? And they got an email back that contained a single sentence. He can have his club. 
<laughs> but it underscores something very important in the way these administrators tend to look at it. Because if you think you're in the right, what do you care if there's an, a nation full of people watching? You're in the right. Fight the good fight. That they change gears so quickly when there's national accountability suggests that they know that what they're doing is against the law. They're aware that it's illegal and they don't care. And the problem is there has not been a position so far that has been dedicated to making sure they do care. That has been dedicated to producing this kind of accountability. That position is mine and it's needed. All right. Now after this, we had a huge influx of students. Uh, we send out group starting packets. <laughs> now I'm hoping Nick is blushing because that's who that is. Um, we sent out group starting packets to all interested students. And at the time, we had something in the vicinity of 252 college affiliates and a dozen high school affiliates. So you've got to imagine that most of our group starting packets are going out to colleges. However, during this period, something like 80% of our group starting packets were going out to high schools. This is not something they were discovering. It's something they've been wanting to have happen for a while. And because they read it in USA Today, they realized they could get in on it. Um, so the students are out there, and they're diverse. And, and what I mean by diverse, and, uh, they're, of course, black, white, male, female. But, but they also have different ideas of ways to go about advancing the cause of humanism and atheism. Some groups want to form a social club, some place that is a sanctuary for themselves, and for other students where they can come and not be bullied and not be judged you know, and have some place to be with people who are like them. You know, some students are even willing to do it at the prospect of getting kicked out of their house. You know, other students want to take the activist route. They, they, want, they want to challenge the pretenses of religion in no unapologetic terms and they can do any of it. They take the ball and they run wherever they want to go and it's beautiful. They've been wanting this for so long, and now they had the chance to do it. <coughs> so here we are, three months later, and lo and behold, we're in the New York Times! <laughs> <laughs> Not bad for three months, eh? Huh? Yeah! That was not nearly enough. I need to feel like a rock star. Yeah! I love my job. Um, and we've got a copy of the article on the Secular Student Alliance table right out there. And go read it. it it's, it's phenomenal. It, it focuses on the Rutherford group down in Florida and all the great things they're doing. But, but there's one quote in it that's, that, well, there's several that struck out to me, but this is the one most uh, applicable to my talk. Um, another member said her father, who's in, the Navy, who's in the Navy, would be angry and disappointed in her. He keeps a roof over my head, she said. I wouldn't want to, start to fight with him. And she asked that her name wasn't used because she didn't want them to grow apart over this. This is not an isolated incident. This is the norm for a lot of them. It's why they're so eager to get to college. Living this type of life in high school is lonely. It's lonely, it's miserable, and it affects people into adulthood. They need this kind of thing. And, and that quote just struck out to me as really uh, solidifying that. So here I'm talking about all these problems, but there are solutions to them. For the ostracism, Coming out is the most important thing. Um, you know, it's one of the things that the gay rights community has so right and has worked so hard for over the last 40 years is they've gotten to a point where more people can come out of the closet being homosexual and be okay with it. And people in the United States are starting to realize that not only do they know gay people, but that they like gay people. And so if we want to remove this stigma, that, that causes this ostracism, that's the way to do it. And we need to create an environment or an atmosphere where people can do it as safely and as comfortably as they can. And these are these Secular Student Alliance High School affiliates that I'm talking about. Uh, vandalism and bullying. We need to organize. When was the last time you ever heard of a bully trying to steal lunch money from a group of people? <laughs> it's the truth. We have to give them a way to organize to, to be something bigger, something that, that, that's a little more intimidating for people who want to push them around. Um, good news clubs, the bane of my existence. Um, what can we do? Well, there's not much we can do about them, but we can give those students a counterpoint. We can give them a room where people are telling them, you're not going to burn in hell. You know, not because you accepted them, just because you're not, and there are people like you. 
we can give them that, and that's the best thing we can do about that type of thing. Obstructive administrators, which I'm, I'm glad they exist in a kind of ironic way, because otherwise I wouldn't have a job. Um, but it tells you that I spend most of my time dealing with obstructive administrators, which gets us to the most boring section of my talk, which is the legal part. So I'm going to make you a deal. Because uh, I, I was running this talk earlier, and I thought to myself, there is no way I'm going to be able to keep people awake through a bunch of legal stuff. Uh, so I'm going to rush through this, and for everybody I see like paying attention, like come up to me afterwards and be like, hey, I paid attention, and I'll get your name down. And I actually have a copy of uh, Ray Comfort's Origin of Species, signed by uh, James Randi, DJ Grothy, Debbie Goddard, um, Dan Barker. Uh, Greta Christina, just a whole host of other famous people. And I'll put all your names into a hat and draw one and I'll mail you the book. You can eBay it for a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> okay, just bear with me through the legal, okay? Um, something to amuse you about the legal part is religious people have done all our work for us. They're, they're really our best friends here. Uh, and the reason for that is, um, the first one I want to talk about is the Equal Access Act. In the early 1980s, college religious groups were getting a little upset because they were saying to their colleges, we're a college group, we want this, the same access to space that other clubs have, and we want access to the same resources, and you're not giving it to us. And the colleges you know, said, well, we can't give it to you because First Amendment, you're a religion, we're a public institution, we can't support you. So there's a big hullabaloo about that, hullabaloo, um, <laughs> and uh, Congress passed the Equal Access Act in 1984, which says so long as your school has an open forum, which in non-lawyer speak, that means if you have so much as a chess club or a tiddlywinks club, you have to give equal access to all groups, including religious groups. So they got their clubs. You know who else got their clubs? <laughs> we did. So thank you for that. Um, other court cases on this. The, uh, the first, I'm gonna, if you want to read that, fine. But I'm just going to tell you uh, the, the conclusions the court reached on these cases. Uh, for Board of Education of Westside Community Schools versus Merrigans, uh, what the court established was that a school could not hold a willing faculty sponsor as a requisite for forming a group. It was even in the lawsuit. Uh, the, the student, um, Brittany Merrigans, had wanted to form a club and they wouldn't give her a faculty sponsor, wouldn't let her have a faculty sponsor because First Amendment. Well, in her lawsuit she said that her, her group should be allowed to form except that the proposed club would not have a faculty sponsor, the school would have to furnish one, and the courts granted it. And this is the precedent that now that we're talking about obstructive administrators, guess what you can't do? Demand a willing faculty sponsor. It works for us, same as it works for them. Um, next one, uh, Pope versus East Brunswick Board of Education. Um, what this one established was that uh, you can't have a faculty sponsor, but it elaborated on it. This one said you can't have a faculty sponsor because it gives credence to groups with mainstream ideas. Whereas any group with a mainstream idea could easily find a faculty sponsor, group with minority opinions couldn't, and it prejudices them. So it's another reason that these obstructive administrators can't use this outlet to stonewall secular groups. Uh, and the last one I want to bring up is Sue, uh, not HSU, but Sue versus Roslyn Union Free School District number three. And this was a really interesting case because it established that the, what they meant by the Equal Access Act wasn't you, f you form a set of rules and then you enforce it equally. They said that wasn't equal access. And it makes sense because say a rule uh, in your school that hats cannot be worn consistently and fairly enforced would prevent Jewish students from expressing uh, their religious traditions. Or a rule that's, uh, in school that said all students must wear shoes at all time, consistently, properly enforced, would prevent the formation of a yoga club. <laughs> Destroying my point. Um, but, but what if we could have people coming in who are waiting in the wings who could take over these groups and could have ideas that were their own? But also, what if we had people coming into colleges who expected there to be secular groups? I had one in high school. Why, wouldn't there, why isn't there one here? And forming them and, and coming in droves. Um, this will help our sustainability. Right now, one of the biggest problems facing our organizing team is that when we affiliate groups every year, we have attrition of a little under 10%. Now, thankfully, we're adding way more groups than we're losing. But this would really chop down on that uh, if we could have those types of students coming in so we had more students and more prepared leaders. Um, it helps people to come out. It gives them, when I, I always talk about you know, that sanctuary, it gives them the support they need, uh, which is how they're going to defeat this stigma on being a non-believer. It creates greater visibility. Um, 
you know, anytime someone's, or, talk about greater visibility, USA Today, New York Times in three months. You know, this is controversial, uh, it, it's something new, and, and the more visibility we have, the less administrators are going to be able to play dirty and, and to do things that, that really hamstring these groups. That's what accountability does. We saw it in the case of Brian Lisko. We will see it in the future. And the last one, not everybody goes to college. Yeah. Um, a very small portion of the country gets to go to college. And so the people oftentimes that are running our community groups or that are contributing to community groups don't have the leadership training or, or all the support that the Secular Student Alliance gives to our college affiliates, which are numerous. I'll get to that in a second. So we need to start you know, getting, in, getting into that, not only to protect the high school students, but to ensure that they have a future in this movement. Uh, and that one gets a bunch of smiley faces because I like that one. <laughs> um, so the growth of the high school program. When I took over the job in January, we had a dozen high school affiliates that we'd acquired in the last four years. Um, I'm told that Stephen F. Austin, Brian Lisko's group, will affiliate today. I talked to him on the phone. And that means that we will have had 10 new affiliates in the last three months. That's a pretty good uptick. But even beyond that, we presently have 34 outstanding group starting packets to groups that haven't affiliated. <laughs> Students who have requested them and are in the process of starting high school clubs who haven't affiliated with us yet. So this is something that is exploding. Oh, you giggled this, oh my god, I forgot to put that in there. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but it's going to keep going this way. It's only going to keep getting bigger. This, this is a completely untapped demographic that for, for growth, for leadership, that we can start focusing on. So now I get to talk about the growth of the Secular Student Alliance as a whole. Yay! This made my bosses happy because they're sitting right over there. Uh, um, we had 30 affiliates in our first year, and starting in 2007, we got this little nifty thing going on. And those of you in college who have taken statistics and know about exponential curves, um, <laughs> this is kind of cool! Because uh, the 2011 here, this is three months into the year. I mean, if we extended this the way it should be, we should probably... I don't know, like project this on the side of the building or something. <laughs> and we are in the middle of an explosion of secularism at this age group. And we can actually confirm it with cool graphics. <laughs> <laughs> I learned how to use PowerPoint. 22% um, of the US population is between the ages of 18 and 29. And of uh, that 22%, they have 29% of the nuns. The nuns are the people who claim no religious affiliation. These, these are our friends. Um, this is the biggest proportion of, of uh, secularism in any demographic. The next best is from uh, ages 30 to 49, who have 38% of the population and appropriately about 41% of the nuns. This is where we are winning. This is our tipping point. This is where the leaders of tomorrow are, are going to be, and this is where the most minds are being changed. And up until January of this year, we'd only focused on college with some intermittent support from Debbie Goddard at the CFI and Liz Liddell at the SSA to the high school groups. And it is something that should have been done a decade ago. Not only because it's a great chance for our movement, but because there have been years now where students are in an atmosphere where they have to face challenges that would just intimidate the ever-loving heck out of you know, people like me, you know, people who work for the AHA, who are facing worse problems than them. It is beyond time when we should have done this. Now, I, I try to stay away from uh, telling personal stories when I give talks because I, I think they're uh, misleading, but um, this talk is kind of about me, so... Um, <laughs> I'm going to make an, a pretentious exception. Um, I, I worked through college. Uh, I always had a full-time job when I was in college. And two of those jobs were in sales. Uh, and I was miserable. Um, because I, I, in order to sell things to people, I had to obscure a lot of the bad and highlight the, the handful of good. Uh, and I felt morally reprehensible, like I was ripping people off. And I couldn't stand it. And I quit both of those jobs. And um, here I am in my new job. Uh, trying to sell you guys the Secular Student Alliance. Um, and I'm doing it with no hitches of conscience, no regrets, and no intention of leaving this job anytime soon. Uh, it has been the best thing that's ever happened to me. Um, yes, I'm a firebrand. <laughs> 
Um, these students at the high school level, like I said, are facing problems uh, that are the same that we, that we face, only worse, and problems that we would never dream of facing. And they deserve our support. They need our support. Uh, and they don't need as much support as you know, adults in the working world. And they don't need as much support as college students. They need more. The problems are worse. And the thing is, there are a litany of fantastic organizations working to advance the cause of secularism in the United States. You know, American Humanist Association is one of them. They're great. I sent them a hundred dollar check last year. I don't think I. Yeah. I don't think I've given that much to my own organization. But but they're doing great work. But there's one organization right now that touches all of them, that touches communities, that touches every one of these groups, and it's the Secular Student Alliance. And it starts at the high school level, producing the leaders that are going to be in charge of the American Humanist Association tomorrow, and in charge of American Atheists tomorrow, and executive director of the Secular Coalition for America tomorrow. If there's, it's like Dawkins said, if there's to be a future worth having in this movement, it starts with the Secular Student Alliance, and it really starts at the high school level. And it's time to really focus on that. And so I'm done. Ah! <laughs> Thank you.